um, Mon Monfred from the University of Wyoming, and um, he'll be speaking today on Jacobian method and structured inverse eigenvalue. Thank you. Um, yes, as uh, mentioned, I'm going to talk about the Jacobian method and structured inverse eigenvalue problems. This is a work that I started with. I started about three years ago with Brian Shea, who was my advisor at the University of Wyoming. And I'm going to talk about mostly about the, just the results, nothing, not, uh, not none of the details. So first of all, let me define, I'm going to give you two definitions today. One of them is the graph of a matrix. So basically, if you have a real symmetric matrix that looks like this, on uh, n rows and n columns, then you can, you can find a graph uh, on n vertices, and the graph on n vertices we define it to be i to be connected to j if the i j and j are now diagonal entry to be non zero. We don't care about the diagonal entries of the matrix. So that's, for example, if a matrix like this would like to have a graph that looks like this one, and then we call a to be in S of g. So this is the graph of a matrix, and what is the problem that we are interested in? Here I have a lambda mu problem. So it says that we have a set of uh, real numbers, lambda 1, mu 1, lambda 2, mu 2, lambda n minus 1, and lambda n, which have this relation as mentioned here, and we have a family of matrices F. Most of the talk I'm going to talk about this family being this family of real symmetric matrices. Then uh, we want to figure out if there is a matrix in this family that has the eigenvalues to be lambda i, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, and when I delete row 1 and column 1 of the matrix, here I denote it by A parenthesis 1, if that one can have the uh, eigenvalues to be mu1, mu2, mu and minus 1. Well, this relation is actually Cauchy's interlacing inequalities. They should have that relation, otherwise it's not going to happen. So, the previous results on this is kind of old problem actually. Fan and Paul in 1957 showed that if the graph of the matrix is a star and we have strict inequalities here, we call it strict interlacing inequalities. Um, if the graph of the matrix is a star, we can, we can show that there's always a solution and up to some permutation, the solution is unique also. Same thing is true for path. The graph of the matrix being a path, Gladwell showed that in 1988 and one year later, Duarte in 1989, showed that that's true also for trees. Again, uniqueness up to some permutations and some choices, but finitely many solutions at the end. So, this is where we start our work. Uh, but before uh, giving you the new results, I'm going to define one more thing here. This is based on the work of Duarte. He doesn't mention it in his work, but we gave it from him, got it from him. So, we say that if you have a matrix that has a graph, that, that graph is a tree. And when I delete a vertex, for example, vertex 1 here, we get some connected components. These connected components, we denote them by, for example, T5, 1. That means that I have deleted vertex 1, and I'm looking at the connected component that has 5 as the neighbor, previous neighbor of 1. So we, the matrix that is related to this part of the graph, we, we say that that is A5, 1, for example. So we say that this matrix A has a Duarte property, with respect to vertex i, if something like this happens, this is an inductive proof, in, sorry, inductive definition. Either a is 1 by 1, that's, that's an obvious case, or the eigenvalues of the matrix when I delete that vertex, everything else in the dotted circles, the, the eigenvalues here strictly interlace the eigenvalue of the big, big matrix, so no coincidences happens here. And every small submatrix that I get here, have the same property. So that means that we are, I'm, I'm defining it inductively. So A, J, I's have also the same, same property, Duarte property, with respect to the vertex J. So we call that this matrix at the end, this big matrix has the Duarte property. This is really important for us. This gives us an, a notion of genericness. So here is uh, what we've done. You said that, well, we don't need that graph to be only a tree. We can extend this result to any connected graph. So this is the same uh, as before. We have a graph which is connected to graph. I, have, I fix a vertex i. We have strict Cauchy interlacing inequalities, and we want to find the real symmetric matrix 
G such that diagram values, uh, sorry, a matrix A with graph G such that diagram values are lambdas, and eigenvalues values when I delete vertex I are mutes. So we said that this is possible. The way that we prove it is by this. First of all, it's a connected graph. Is it has a spanning three, so we take out a spanning three, and the board just solves that problem for us for that three. Well, now we are looking at the three. We are missing some edges. That means that some of the entries on the matrix are zero. We want them to be non-zero. So what do we do? We show that the, the solution that uh, Duarte gives us is generic in some sense. I'm not going to define what, you, what do I mean by generic. If you're interested, we can talk after, after this. Um, but we show that that's, an, that's a generic uh, solution. That means that we can perturb the entries. For example, those zero entries that we want to be non-zero, we perturb and we make them to be some epsilons. Then adjust the rest of the entries that have been non-zero without making them zero and still get the same eigenvalues for the matrix A and matrix A to leave the row I and column I. So that is basically the idea. This is what we call it the Jacobian method. So the other results that we get here. So this is, uh, this has been asked by Sean Fallett of the University of Virginia in Canada. He was interested in having a realization for the matrix that has eigenvalues lambda and they are all distinct from each other. And the graph of the matrix is again a given connected graph G. And on top of that, we want none of the eigenvectors, none of the eigenvectors of the matrix have a zero entry. So basically we say that they are nowhere zero. All, all the eigenvectors for all the eigenvalues. They are non-zero. Well, why is this important? Because if they are non-zero, then if you perturb the eigenvalues a little bit, perturb the eigenvectors a little bit, perturb the matrix a little bit, they're not going to change signs. And that's in some applications that's very important. We don't want the direction of the eigenvalues, eigenvectors to change. We want it to be in the same uh, quadrant, if in R2. So we, we use the same method and we solve this problem. We, now we say that for any distinct lambdas that you give me, I can find a matrix, a matrix, real symmetric matrix that has these eigenvalues and eigenvectors are nowhere zero. What else we did? Um, C.K. Lee of the uh, University of the College of William and Mary asked the question that, well, you've solved this problem for uh, First order Cauchy interlacing inequalities when you delete one row and column. What if we look at the other kinds of interlacings? For example, if we delete two rows and uh, two columns of the matrix, you'll have uh, second order Cauchy interlacing inequalities. Can we solve those kind of problems? Well, here uh, we answer that question in a positive way. We answer that question in a positive way. And before I'm, I'm fixing a kind of three here. This is a generic three. I have two vertices, one and two, and I'm saying that these two are connected to each other. And the left side of this, made, this graph, I call it alpha, and the right side, I call it beta. This is because I want to define some, some introduce some restrictions on the, on the graph later. when I'm talking about the result that we got. So this is the graph I'm going to be talking about. So here is the result. It's the same thing as the lambda mu problem that we had, but now we are deleting two vertices. So I have a three vertices, one and n, and one and two are adjacent to each other. I get a set of lambda eigenvalues, lambda one through lambda n, and a set of eigenvalues for the matrix when I delete two rows and two columns. So tau one through tau n minus two, we call it lambda tau problem. And well, second order Cauchy interlacing inequality says that tau i now should be not the between every two consecutive lambda i's, but between every other uh, lambda i's. And you are looking at the, at the strict inequality case. Here again, we need this for some genericness. And well, also lambda i, tau i cannot be equal to the one in the middle, because again, we don't want those coincidences to happen. And I'm saying here that there are k tau pairings. What does that mean? That means that well, by quotient to less inequalities, these tau's are between lambda i and lambda i plus two, there are at most two of them can be there between two, two, two of these lambda, consecutive lambdas. At most two of them can be there. It's just counting. So I'm saying that there are k of them. We call those things that when, when it happens, we call it tau pairings. There are k of them. And that's the restriction that I get on my tree. The left hand side of the tree and the right hand side of the tree. So this is t left hand side deleting vertex one, t right hand side deleting vertex two. 
each of you should have at least k vertices when I have k tau variance. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. We are, we are not going to be able to solve that problem. There is no solution to that problem. If all of these are satisfied, then we get a matrix, real symmetric matrix that has eigenvalues lambda i. When I delete two vertices, one and two, then we get this uh, eigenvalues tau 1 through tau n minus 2. Again, we are, we are here, this proof of this one is just combinatorial. We are not using any Jacobian method, but then we extend this for to any connected graph. Here, our connected graphs not, are not all connected graphs. We have some restrictions. The restrictions are that we have spanning tree, which has this situation. That connected graph should have this kind of spanning tree, otherwise it's not going to work. So the result that using Jacobian method has been extended to connected graphs with those with that necessary combinatorial restrictions. And recently, my colleague um, asked me another question. He is interested in skew symmetric matrices. He said that, well, you have solved this for symmetric matrices. What was skew symmetric matrices? Well, first, my first response was that, well, we don't have Cauchy interlacing inequalities there. But, well, we have actually we have Cauchy interlacing inequalities. They are on the imaginary axis. So what happened was that we, we could we were able to prove this for again all the connected graphs using using Jacobian method, but not for all, all of them. We get, again we have some necessary combinatorial restrictions on those graphs. They should have some specific, some special type of uh, spanning trees, and if they have this, the graph that we have we are given has that uh, satisfies that restriction, we fix the vertex i. We have I can write real numbers lambda 1 through lambda n. These are real numbers, but then I can realize a matrix A that eigenvalues of A are plus minus lambda 1 i, which is on the imaginary axis, and then plus minus uh, lambda n i, and so on. And A i has eigenvalues of this. Well, this is here in this theorem expressing it only for the case that the number of the rows and columns are even. Well, the similar thing happens when we have. 2n plus 1 odd number of vertices. Well, that's where I want to stop.